Um, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. We produce the weekly Medical Center Hour. Delighted to see you here. Medicaid expansion in Virginia, working on it. This June, Governor Ralph Northam signed a budget bill that gives 400,000 low-income Virginians access to government health insurance through Medicaid. This action, as those of us who've been around Virginia for a while, was a long time coming. Four years, in fact, and it marked an upbeat, bipartisan close to a bitter battle in Virginia's General Assembly. An option under the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion makes additional low-income persons in participating states eligible for care that's funded chiefly with federal dollars. Virginia's decision to join 32 other participating states hinged on a bipartisan legislative compromise to impose work requirements on the Medicaid recipients. A few other states have taken similar positions, but debate about work requirements continues in government, in policy circles, and in the courts. Our Medical Center Hour today examines Medicaid expansion in Virginia, something that will be implemented this January from the policy, political, and healthcare perspectives with a focus especially on what it means locally to us in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. The hour is short, but we've tapped three experts to efficiently unpack this important matter, and to do so we trust with time left for your questions and discussion. In order of presentation, let me welcome Professor Carolyn Engelhard on my immediate right, health policy analyst in the Department of Public Health Sciences here at UVA. In the center, the Honorable David Toscano, delegate for the 57th District and minority leader in the Virginia House of Delegates. And on my far right, Dr. Chris Guyamagami, UVA Health Systems, Chief Medical Officer and Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. None of our speakers, I'm happy to say, had any conflicts of interest to disclose. So um, now please welcome Professor Carolyn Engelhardt, and we're going to work our way through Medicaid expansion, working on it. So hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Good. I'm so happy to be here. I want to thank uh, Marcia for the invitation. I want to thank Dean Wilkes for supporting this program. And I want to say a big hey to all my former students and colleagues. I'm, I love it that you're here because it means that you think this is an important topic. And it is a very important topic. So let's get going. My job today is to give you the big picture is to paint the national landscape, and then we'll zero in on what it means to Virginia and then to the University of Virginia health system. So um, Virginia is the latest state to expand their Medicaid program. It was a bit long in coming. Uh, it was very, this topic was very contentious uh, in the previous uh, governor under the previous governor. I'm sure David can touch on that more if you want to talk about it. But this is a map of the states that have expanded to date. You can see the ones in dark blue have expanded. It, as Marcia mentioned, in Virginia, the governor signed it into law in June. It rolls out January 1, 2019. Interestingly, in Maine, this just gives you a little bit of flavor of just how political this program is, Maine voters, through referendum, passed Medicaid expansion multiple times. The governor refused to implement it. They sued the governor. They took the governor to court. And the court ruled now that Maine has to do Medicaid expansion. And the governor, LePage, <laughs> Actually, in the application for Medicaid expansion to the federal government, to CMS, actually asked the federal government not to approve it. So we'll see what happens. Medicaid expansion is on the ballot this fall. 
in uh, four states. You can see here Utah, Idaho, Montana, and Nebraska. In Virginia, uh, up to 400,000 Virginians will be eligible under the Medicaid expansion program. Virginia is a state that has a very lean traditional Medicaid program. If you are a parent in Virginia, you are not eligible for Medicaid if you make more than 30% of the federal poverty level. The federal poverty level is about $12,000. So you would have to make less than 30% of that as a parent to get Medicaid in Virginia. Now with the Medicaid expansion, these parents and childless adults up to 138% of the federal poverty level will be eligible to get health insurance through this program. This is a map of sorts of the states that have applied for or received approval for work requirements in Medicaid expansion. Indiana and New Hampshire plan to implement their requirements in 2019. They have approvals. Kentucky was the first state to receive approval, a waiver approval for the work requirement and immediately that was challenged in federal court and a federal judge stopped uh, the implementation of the work requirement saying that it was at odds with the intent of the Medicaid program. Arkansas's work requirement did go forward, just completed its 90-day review, and of the 26,000 people who are required un, in Arkansas to fulfill a work requirement, over 4,000 have lost coverage as a result of not fulfilling the work requirement. There is a lawsuit pending, just as there was in Kentucky, and that lawsuit will go before actually the same judge that heard the Kentucky case. The Virginia uh, Medicaid expansion program was passed with the understanding that Virginia would submit to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services an 1115 waiver requesting work requirements. Uh, that document, a draft of, of that language, came out just last week. It's now up for public comment and um, there needs to be a report on the status of the waiver application by December 1st. I'm sure that David will talk about that. So what are the promises and the perils of work requirements? We have enough data now about states that have expanded their Medicaid program to know that it has been successful. It is expensive. Health insurance is expensive. Health care is expensive. But self-reported health status is up, medical bankruptcy is down, patients have established connections with primary care providers, and they've been better able to integrate behavioral and physical health. By and large, Medicaid work requirements are popular. 70% of Americans support them. Uh, I think it just is sort of intuitive that we believe that able-bodied people should work, people should take individual responsibility for themselves and their families. Uh, and so, at least theoretically, it sounds like a really good idea. But as always with health policy, and you all know that, the devil is often in the details. If all states enacted work requirements, only 3% of the over 70 million people on Medicaid would immediately lose coverage. That's because a significant number of folks are exempt and, uh, and most folks on Medicaid already work. However, when the work requirements come in, because of some of the documentation requirements, because of the way people work, seasonal workers may not work 80 hours in a month, uh, because of inability to document your hours, 
and submit that, another 25 to 40% could lose their Medicaid coverage. In Arkansas, of the over 4,000 who lost Medicaid just this month as a result of not being able to meet the requirements for work, uh, surveys indicate that the folks who lost it said they, they didn't have good communication about it, they didn't have a computer, you have to submit your documentation through a portal called Arkansas Access, and most were just generally unaware there was even a requirement. So it sort of begs the question about how we can do work requirements so that it actually fulfills the intent and there isn't all of these sort of negative externalities as a result. The Arkansas experience may be a cautionary tale for Virginia and for other states looking forward to implementing work requirements in their Medicaid expansion programs. All righty, so with that, I'm going to turn over to my friend, David Toscano. I like this picture of you, David, much better than a headshot because most of you probably don't know, David actually has a PhD in sociology. He was a professor before he became a politician. He uh, does best, I think, when he sits in groups of people. This was at a town hall. David and I have known each other for over 30 years. And um, the last time we were on this program was the day after Donald Trump was elected. So I like to think we come at very exciting times. <laughs> That's sweet, Carolyn. I tell you, it looked like I was in a bath, a men's room. <laughs> I don't know what that says. Um, you, were in a, uh, you were in a school cafeteria. Yeah, OK, thank you for clarifying me. <laughs> uh, it's really uh, great to be here today. It's really daunting to be right in the middle of two experts. You know, Carolyn is such a policy guru. And of course, the doc is on the front lines of providing services to people. You know, what do I know? I'm just a small town country lawyer trying to do the best I can representing Charlottesville and all Maryland General Assembly. Um, the Did you write everything down? Oh, my God. You can all hear me, though, right, can't you? Yeah. OK. <laughs> now is it on? OK, now you can hear me. Thank you. I just told a joke, and now it's not going to be picked up on YouTube. <laughs> the other joke, of course, is that over the last four years, I've given so many speeches on the House floor about Medicaid expansion that I have enough to fill my own YouTube channel. Uh, this year, actually, I only gave one, and that was at the very end. Sometimes lawyers know that you keep your mouth shut if you think things are going your way. We thought things were going our way. The only speech I gave on the House floor was the day the House passed a budget that included Medicaid expansion, which was probably the most consequential vote that I have taken in my 12 years of service in the General Assembly. When you think about 400,000 people getting access to health insurance with one vote, that is a pretty, uh, pretty good feeling about what happened. Um, now, so let's go in. It's a long and winding road. But you make no wine before it's time. And you'll see later, we've been talking about making this wine for years and years and years. At the same time, as Stevie Win Winwood once said, when you see the chance, you take it. And Jackie Robinson took that chance. And who knows who this person is on the right-hand side? Amy? Abby? Is, what her, is that her name? Abby Wom Wombach? Well, OK, you all know. <laughs> so here's the long and winding road. Starts in 2010 when the Affordable Care Act is passed. No Republicans vote for that bill. It had to get put through by shenanigans involving what's called reconciliation, but it did pass. In that bill, two things were really important. Well, a number of things were important, but included was a requirement that everybody have health insurance, and two, that Medicaid be expanded in every single one of the 50 states. All right, but then June 28th, my birthday, 2012, along comes a court decision on the Supreme Court strikes down the requirement that states have to expand Medicaid. Now it becomes optional, and that's where the fight begins. 
So with first debates in January and February, my hair is darker. I probably have fewer pounds, but I did give those speeches. Expansion was rejected in that first General Assembly session. We did create, however, a commission to study it and supposedly to implement it if all these Medicaid reform efforts were effective. In point of fact, there were a lot of reforms that were enacted in our Medicaid system designed to provide better service and bring down costs, but it didn't matter. After all those reforms, the legislature continued to say no to Medicaid expansion. In 2014, Terry McAuliffe was sworn in. He, he ran on Medicaid expansion and tried to get it done for his four years. Uh, we had a number of initiatives proposed, including this thing called Marketplace Virginia. The irony about medical expan Medicaid expansion from a political standpoint is that initially it was the state Senate who was very much pushing for Medicaid expansion. The Democrats had control of the state Senate as, at a point in time. They were pushing this. They had Republican moderates with them at the time. The House was controlled by conservative Republicans, and they weren't having anything to do with Medicaid expansion. This year, however, it's flipped. It was the House that made the difference on Medicaid expansion, and the Senate, which is now flipped a little bit to Republican control, the moderates are gone. They were brought, I could say, kicking and screaming to the table uh, to get a budget that had Medicaid expansion. So, you know, wait a few years, things change in politics. Boy, do they change. Uh, um, and so a number, there are a number of things that happened along the way. You can read about it in my book when I publish it. It's called Medicaid Wars. That's not the book. That's a chapter in the book. But there are all these machinations that go on in, in politics. And things that you think are going to turn out the way you thought they would don't happen that way. We thought we had a real shot at getting Medicaid expansion in 2014. We had everything lined up. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, Senator Puckett, who is a senator out of Southwest Virginia, decides he's going to resign just before we had the vote on the budget. And when he was gone, we lost a vote and we couldn't get it passed. It was very, very discouraging. Okay, January and February of 2015. Now there are a lot of players involved in this process, a lot of lobbyist groups, a lot of activity, a lot of push. And frankly, thank you all for all of your work in trying to get this done. We could not have done it without the medical community and activists around the state pushing for this. But there was a lot of activity. Uh, but Republicans controlled the House of Delegates and the Senate. And the, Repub uh, the General Assembly stripped McCall's Medicaid expansion language from the budget. McCall kept putting the language in. The Republicans kept taking it out. Um, you know, again, Medicaid expansion was not a, quote, bill. It was in the budget because it was had to do with an appropriations, an appropriation. House and uh, Senate reject Medicaid again along party lines in 2016. And uh, then in 2017, we, Medicaid expansion failed again. But what was happening at the same time was we were expanding the more traditional Medicaid to other groups of people. So we were bringing more people into the system. But the reimbursement, as you know, on old Medicaid was 50-50. In other words, every dollar we put up as a state, the feds uh, only uh, uh, matched uh, with, uh, uh, with the dollar. So it's 50-50 split. New Medicaid has the feds paying originally 100% of the cost of expansion, and then it dropped down to 90% in 2020. So we were expanding old Medicaid, but we weren't expanding new Medicaid. People wondered why we were doing this. This didn't seem the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars, but we still couldn't get it passed. All right, then the United States Senate says no to the repeal of the ACA, Senator McCain's infamous. Uh, then the earthquake, November 17, 2017, Democrats win 15 seats in the House of Delegates, most of whom ran on Medicaid expansion. Republicans said, uh-oh, there's something going on here. We better alter our plans. So the Republican leadership in the House decided to work with Governor Northam to come up and support a program to expand Medicaid. Now, it wasn't unanimous on the Republican side. All 49 Democrats voted for the bill, but only about 17 or so Republicans. 
out of the 51 they have. And so now, uh, 2018, uh, we're working on this budget, and we get the 18 Republicans to join us. Uh, it took a while, because we didn't get it done in the, general, uh, the regular session. It took some time, but, you know, sometimes good things come to those who wait. And uh, we finally got it, and finally on J June 7th, Northam signed the budget uh, with a work requirement. Now, no one is quite sure what's going to happen with this work requirement. Uh, there are ch core challenges to it. There are so many exemptions in the work requirement that most people will not likely be affected. But one of the concerns is that you will, in the process of implementing the work requirement, you will knock off people who formerly received Medicaid. That's where the court fight's going to happen, whether you knock off people who formerly received it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, September 20th, we put in our waiver form to on the work requirement because that has to be approved by the federal government. We don't know when that'll happen. It could take months before they approve it. Uh, here are the populations served uh, by Medicaid. Of course, most people on Medicaid are, are kids, uh, people who are disabled, and elderly folks. There are very, in Virginia, very small numbers of people who could actually work anyway. Uh, and here are some of the breakdowns for who, who can qualify. And uh, I'm going to go through this real fast. We can come back to it. Uh, good coverage benefits for people. It's really going to help a lot of people to get on. Um, there are some cost sharing uh, in, uh, situations here with the Medicaid program that we're expanding in Virginia. And they call the work program called TEOP. I don't know why they came up with that. But everything has to have a bunch of letters in it. Uh, and uh, uh, remember, the old traditional Medicaid was a 50% federal match. The new Medicaid was, uh, is going to get to 90%. The feds will pay 90%. And you guys can study this at your leisure if you want to know the cost. Uh, it's always interesting to see how we save money by embracing Medicaid expansion. In point of fact, we couldn't have passed the budget we, had, we passed this year without Medicaid expansion because what happens is you take a lot of federal dollars, you're bringing them into the state to replace money that you otherwise would have paid for a different thing, like indigent care. $100 million we spend on indigent care. But once we take in the federal dollars and we have Medicaid expansion, we're taking federal dollars and we're using it to help fund the cost of indigent care, like at UVA, and that frees up that 100 million, well, it's not totally 100 million, it gets freed up, but it frees up a bunch of that money that then goes into teacher salaries, you know, public safety, environmental protection, other places. And we were always arguing we, that we would save money to, we, that we could invest in other places if we took the Medicaid funds, and in point of fact, it was like a $500 million difference in our budget this year because we took the Medicaid funds. That's a big deal because it helps people other than those who really need the health insurance. Okay. So now I get to turn over to somebody who actually really does work as opposed to talking like me. And you're going to explain what's happening next, right, doctor? Thanks. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, glad everybody could make it here. Uh, so just by way of introduction, uh, it's sort of funny to hear um, them referring to me as an expert because I think I'm, I'm the local color here. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the uh, color commentary guy because uh, I serve as the chief medical officer of the health system and work for Dr. Wilkes in the dean's office as well. And um, you know, so what does that mean? Well, it means that we actually run the operation of the hospital and the clinics. Uh, I'm an emergency physician by uh, trade and still see patients uh, every Friday in the ER here in Charlottesville. So I, I've had a, a long uh, career of, um, you know, taking care of people who are uninsured and underinsured. And, you know, I think you, you really uh, realize the impact of either having health insurance or, or health care coverage versus not when you see these people who have really tried their best, uh, they've worked hard, 
but uh, the expense and the hassles of uh, trying to get health care are sometimes very, very large barriers to, to many people. Uh, and uh, in the emergency department, uh, we see people whose problem solving has, has basically failed. They've tried to do what they can, but they end up seeing us for sometimes very, very serious issues that could have been taken care of at an earlier state uh, much more easily at uh, much less expense. But sometimes it's very simple things that they just need some access. And so by law, in an emergency department, we see all comers. It doesn't matter and, and, uh, if you have the ability to pay or not, which is a, a great, great thing. So that's my commercial for emergency medicine as a specialty for the students in the crowd. Um, but so in terms of a uh, societal impact, you know, let's talk about what having coverage means and who's affected. You've seen a couple of slides already. Their slides were much nicer than mine, but that, these are uh, very basic. So just one thing to remember. So in current condition, if you are a resident of the Commonwealth of Virginia and you are a childless adult, uh, you basically don't qualify for Medicaid. All right, so you know, we do have an uninsured population that we deal with. Now, if you have people who are working, they're the working poor, it is very difficult, as we know, to buy um, insurance uh, on uh, the uh, public exchanges. So, and because of legislative decisions and court decisions since the Affordable Care Act has been passed, um, you know, we have a lot of uncovered people still. And so this is a big, big problem. But many people don't realize what Medicaid really does cover and what it doesn't. Most people think Medicaid and they think, well, that's you know, poor people's insurance. And it's like, well, that's only partially true. Not everybody even is eligible. And so this is a great step forward um, for uh, people in the Commonwealth. Um, this has been covered already. So I was really asked to kind of talk about how does this affect the patients in Virginia? And then more specifically, what will be the impacts at UVA? Because many of you actually are employees here and, and you're sort of saying, well, this is interesting. You know, We know that we are a safety net hospital. What is this going to mean um, for our medical center and for our clinics as well? Um, if all of a sudden 400,000 um, residents of the Commonwealth suddenly have some kind of health care coverage. So let's start with the map. So we're here in the star here, uh, Charlottesville, in the middle of that sort of upside down triangle of Albemarle County. And what we we consider our primary service area, which is in red. Okay, so that is uh, us as well as those five surrounding counties. So when we start thinking about who are we delivering service to, and more uh, uh, concretely, who are we responsible for delivering health care for um, in, in our community? Uh, this is sort of our community and the, the near in community. <clears throat> so any health care need that these people have, we'd like to think that if they choose to come to UVA, we can handle it. Okay. So in that primary service area, uh, we are going to see some uh, increased access um, to care. But the people who live in this area are frankly very fortunate. Because of the, the support of the university's support of our state legislature and the governor over the years, we've been able to be funded to take care of all comers. That's not true for other hospitals. So we have, of course, one other community hospital here in town. But in those other counties, there actually aren't any other hospitals. And you have to get to about a 60-mile radius to start seeing where there are other hospitals impacted. Um, so there's access here, but as soon as you leave that red area and go to the south of us, and especially to the southwest of us, the access is much more severely limited. Sure, there are hospitals there, and there are hospital-based clinics, but if you don't have any kind of health care coverage, you may have trouble just finding a family doctor. You may have trouble with the bureaucracy of getting into a, a different hospital system. And so it is not infrequent um, that in all of our clinics and all of our inpatient facilities and even in the ED that you have somebody who's driven um, from way down here in Wise County or down by the uh, panhandle of Virginia to come here just to get an appointment uh, that might be three or four months from now. So that is really what a lot of people are, are dealing with now. So here's my one Virginia fun fact for the, for the lecture. So see that, that, that point down there by Tennessee and, and Kentucky there? If you look at the whole United States map and you just sort of look vertically, that little point is actually west of Detroit. So that tells you how much geography there is and how far these people are willing to go um, to get here uh, because of this economic disparity that we have. And so this is really great news that um, we're going to improve on that. 
<clears throat> so what it's really going to do is not so much change our access to our local people here, but really access to some of these other areas. Now, of course, there's sort of the, what, they, what they're calling now the urban crescent uh, on the eastern part of the state. There's a lot more access to care, but south and southwest in particular, there will be some big impacts here. So I think that ultimately the patients will have better primary care access, hopefully better preventative care. And one of the great uh, wins, as uh, Mr. Toscano had uh, mentioned, in this prior year, there was significant expansion of mental health services and particularly substance abuse treatment. So these are very impactful for everybody. Um, as we know, if you, if you pick up a newspaper, if you read any medical journal, the opioid crisis is here, it is in Virginia, and it is significant and it is real. And so um, the ability to um, provide those services for a larger group of people is really gonna have a significant impact um, on our population. So what about UVA? Um, you might say, okay, well, this is great, you know? There's uh, a lot more funding for all of these services. Um, is that gonna help with some of uh, the UVA Medical Center's sometimes uh, financial issues? And uh, maybe. <laughs> the answer is not entirely clear. As I said, we've been very fortunate over the years because we are a safety net hospital in a very good state. Um, and what I mean by that is that through a number of mechanisms, um, UVA is considered a, what they call a type one hospital, where we serve uh, patients with a disproportionate share of indigency. And we're a GME hospital, so graduate medical education hospital, where we receive additional funding. And th those are the ways that we've been able to keep our doors open to everyone. So our CFO, our chief financial officer for uh, the health system likes to say, we had Medicaid expansion before there was Medicaid expansion. And that's kind of true. So locally, we're probably looking at some offsets here. So we'll probably do just fine. We will be stable, um, but there's not gonna be some giant you know, windfall financially for us. What's gonna happen though is that the people around us, the providers around us are gonna be able to fund programs for these underserved people. And there will be a little bit of an offset in terms of maybe some of those distances traveled uh, to come here just for simple lower complexity care. And that'll allow us to um, pursue our mission of being the home of complex care in Virginia. So we can uh, deliver more advanced uh, care with some of the capacity that that will, that will free up. So, um, you know, I think if you look at the shift of patients, um, it'll be great for our, our local people who are basically the working poor, uh, who will now have um, broader choices for access. Uh, I like to talk about urgent care. Okay. One of the things that we've seen in Medicaid expansion states is there's pent up demand. So as soon as uh, people start uh, um, getting coverage, they start signing up to see a doctor or they'll seek care in many environments. Uh, and you start finding diseases, unfortunately, and you have to take care of those diseases. So there's this pent up demand in the beginning when it starts to level out. But every state that's, that's done this seems to, seems to confirm that. Um, and it's not a, not a case of abuse. These people need care. Um, one of the things that has been difficult in our area <clears throat> is, and, and in, in Virginia in general, is because of uh, decreased access or because of lack of coverage, uh, people have used emergency departments a lot. And um, interestingly, um, lots of providers these days take Medicaid, okay? So private practice um, physicians may, may not necessarily take on a whole lot of new Medicaid patients, um, but now, because of consolidation in the industry, uh, you have large hospital systems. They pretty much all take Medicaid. And you have other entities like you know, MedExpress up on 29. Um, that actually, I checked. I looked on their website before I uh, came to give this talk. They actually will accept Medicaid patients. And so in some respects, that's actually very, very good. That's uh, getting the right patient in the right care environment in a timely fashion for a lower cost. So, you know, you're gonna see alternate care models, um, but you're gonna see access to care. And I think overall that's gonna be very good for, for lots of people. So here at UVA, um, 
you know, again, we're not expecting to see anything, anything big in terms of um, financial changes in net. Uh, we do hope to, that we will be able to um, see patients earlier in the course of their diseases and get them on the right track. Uh, open up that access for some of our more complex services by really allowing patients to stay closer to home in facilities that are going to be basically better supported and better funded uh, in some of our rural areas. Um, Mr. Toscano uh, mentioned um, the indigent care um, funds, and so just two words on that. Uh, basically, this is a federal mandate that indigent care funds uh, flow through the states and, and get to where the care is delivered. Uh, in the original um, Affordable Care Act, and I'm not the health policy expert, so I'll defer to Dr. Engelhardt, um, there was a scheduled ramp down on uh, those, uh, what they call DISH funds. And so we don't know what's going to happen. UVA, again, very fortunate. We receive a fair amount of, of DISH funding um, for all of our uh, operations and, and for our providers. We don't know how that's going to work out, and I think that's going to be an interesting discussion to see um, you know, how that turns out in the, in the near future. Uh, but overall, I think, uh, you know, when I am back in the ED, you know, we will be keeping an eye out for people who, as soon as this uh, becomes live, we, we can direct towards enrollment and uh, try and uh, uh, allow them to have many, many different care options um, rather than, than just having to wait months for an appointment with someone, someone like us. So um, I, I look forward to the questions and the discussion. Thanks to all three of you. We have um, a wonderful amount of time for, um, to open a discussion with our speakers. Um, we have a couple of mics uh, that we will bring to you so that um, your comments and questions can um, be recorded as well. I'll ask that you please identify yourself when you offer a question or comment. You may want to indicate also to which of the presenters um, you're directing your question, or you could say all three or any of the three, uh, however you want, you want to do that. And uh, we'll, um, we'll see where we go from here. Thanks, Marcia. Um, I'm Susan Kirk. I oversee the Medical Residence and Fellows here. And I have a question for Delegate Toscano. Um, so shortly after his election, uh, we invited Representative Piriello to come give a talk about uh, the ACA and Medicaid expansion. And those empty rows that you see now were filled by members of the Tea Party. Um, and it wasn't a public uh, lecture, but um, somehow they showed up. So my question to you, and we all know how that story ended, um, do you see this as a real turning point or is there some risk for political backlash for this decision? Uh, great question. You know, there's always a risk for, quote, political backlash on any decision. Uh, but if you take a look at, uh, at the, the polling data on Medicaid expansion, uh, a great majority of people think it's a good idea. I think that's one of the reasons why the dynamic shifted in the last General Assembly session. I think people began to see that there is a lot of support for this all over the state, uh, including places that you wouldn't think, uh, well, places that don't vote, quote, Democratic. I mean, this has kind of been seen as a Democratic issue, but if you look at the places that benefit most by Medicaid expansion, a lot of the people who live in those districts probably haven't voted for a Democrat in 10 or 15 years and may never vote for a Democrat. But a lot of us thought, well, this is the right thing to do, uh, even if it, doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it would not affect our ability to get elected to those places. And I think that's part of the role of representatives in ensuring that the Commonwealth is strong, wherever people live and whoever they vote for. Because after you get elected, you try to represent the people. Now, will this come back to haunt folks? I don't know. Let's see what happens in the next election cycle, which begins in January of 2019 for Virginia state reps. If a lot of the Republicans who voted for expansion get primaried by Tea Party people and get defeated, 
then you will know that there was a political backlash. Uh, but so far, we don't see a lot of that going on. We may see it, but we don't right now. If I could just jump in real quick. Um, <clears throat> 70 million plus people are on Medicaid in this country, more than on Medicare. And if the Medicaid expansion has done anything nationally is it's normalized what Medicaid is. One in five Virginia, excuse me, one in five Americans is on Medicaid. What does this mean? It means that every family now knows someone on Medicaid, it's either your child, your parent in a skilled nursing facility, someone who's receiving uh, opioid uh, substance abuse treatment. It is no longer a stigma. It's no longer them. It's us. I'm uh, Dr. Mary Preston, and I work at the um, Green Free Clinic and also teach, teach here. Um, I have two questions for Chris. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one is very tricky. Um, and I have heard a rumor that um, because people will have insurance, that UVA may not have the financial discounts. And this would certainly affect a number of um, the patients who perhaps do not even um, qualify, who are making maybe $40,000 a year. Um, second question. Um, is that what is the um, primary care capacity to take all these new patients? We're not putting out a lot of uh, primary care docs, um, and so this is an advertisement, too, for it's actually a fun specialty. Um, <laughs> it's varied. You don't do the same thing every day. Um, very much like um, ER, you never know who's going to be walking through your doors. And I love it, and I'm going to keep on doing it, but um, these are some issues that I have. Okay, um, well, thanks for the heads up on the trickiness. Um, and uh, also, thank you for helping take care of my mother. Uh, you're one of her doctors, so. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so um, I have not heard any rumor around um, removing discounts for um, self-pay patients or that we would be changing the um, uh, the, the financial screening process where people have different tiers, um, you know, all the way from, you know, some discount to, you know, basically complete waiver. So I can uh, get back to you on that one, but I, I have not heard any rumor there. I think we're a lot more pragmatic than that um, because uh, with all due respect to all the work that's done, you know, you, you never know how this is going to turn out. Um, and you never know exactly what um, the ultimate impacts are going to be, how many patients are going to come, what's really going to change here on the ground, um, and then, you know, what are the, the revenues going to look like on that. So I, I'm not aware of any um, proactive look on, on that. I think that would be a, a pretty big leap to say, okay, let's start planning ahead. I mean, in terms of um, uh, primary care capacity, uh, this is a... Uh, you know, a tricky question as well. Um, we showed the map of you know, what we consider to be our primary service area and what I would say is our commitment to, to care for our community. Our access, and you may disagree with this, our access for new um, primary care providers is fairly reasonable right now. We're not the only player in town. Okay, so there are other systems uh, here who also provide uh, primary care as well as individual um, um, practices. Not, maybe not as many as there used to be um, because there's been a, a lot of consolidation. Um, I think this uh, gets more towards, um, uh, a little bit more towards population growth, honestly, in this area. So who here has you know, driven down um, 29 or on West Main Street lately and found, found themselves going a little slower than they used to go? Um, the, the population growth in this county is um, very high. Um, and I think that we're seeing some of the pressures on our healthcare system just related to, to that alone. Uh, additionally, we've become a little bit of a retirement community. 
And so we have an aging population. And um, so uh, another plug for Dr. Preston, you know, we need more geriatricians specifically uh, to uh, take care of uh, some of our new primary care population. So it's something I think we have to keep an eye on. Um, just to answer your question more directly, we don't have any plans to open up any new offices right now, but we're looking at other, we're looking at lots of ways to increase access um, to our current offices and how to provide the right care models. Uh, this gets into um, a number of issues around um, team care. So are you always going to see a physician or sometimes will you see a nurse practitioner or another type of provider? Um, particularly, this is important with the burden of mental health um, issues where we need to use lots of different team members, psychologists and licensed clinical social workers and people like that to, to, to help as well. So, so we are looking at all of that as well. Hi, I'm Richard Ridge from Nursing Professional Development over at the hospital in the School of Nursing. Um, and, and this is for uh, Delegate Toscano. Some of us probably, uh, 2020 can't come quick enough in terms of the presidential election and, and what could happen, but um, in terms of the funding, what has to happen at the national level by 2020 to continue Medicaid period, Medicaid expansion? Um, if you can just elaborate on that, what has to happen to continue funding after that point? Well, yeah, I mean, you're the health policy guru, you know, but it's all about appropriations. You gotta have an appropriation bill that passes that, that puts the money in. But uh, I think that they'd have a hard time not funding it uh, under the, the, the law. And I think they could be compelled to fund it. I think you, uh, you might wanna weigh in. I mean, the, we know what's happening at the federal level. The ACA, even though it's been any efforts to repeal it have been defeated, I don't know, 50, 60 times. The Trump administration is under, trying to undermine it. You know, I, I was going to comment on the question here. The, uh, they're undermining the insurance markets uh, by uh, not enforcing the individual mandate. They're undermining the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the exchanges by not providing the CSRs that will help the insurance companies. And as a result, what we're seeing is all this dynamic conflict within the insurance markets now. And it's percolating in here to Charlottesville. You can see what happened with the Optima rates. And it gets into things about hospitals and what they reimburse the insurance companies, how that affects the rate, rates, et cetera. But long and short of it is, yeah, you have to pass a budget because otherwise you can't fund it. So um, the two top issues going into the midterm elections are corruption in Washington and health care. And specifically under health care, it's keeping the ban on pre-existing condition exclusions. So there's a maxim in health policy, and that is it's much harder to take away something you've already given. So David is right. Uh, Medicaid is an entitlement. It's an entitlement program passed in the mid-1960s along with Medicare. As I mentioned earlier, uh, as Medicaid expansion expands, and clearly there's a demand for it, we have it on four state ballots in the midterms as a referendum, the more groundswell there will be to uh, offer these programs. What I hope we see, because I think your question is really good, and that is, how can we afford this? And how, where is the money going to come from? And so I think it's really important. The next challenge that we have in this country is to look at what we spend our health care dollars on and uh, how we begin to control either the supply or the demand and certainly the price, particularly with regard to pharmaceuticals. Other questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Morgan Taylor, and I'm a social worker here at the hospital. And I was wondering if you could explain more about the work requirement that's coming forward for Virginia, if, it, if there's any ideas about what that would look like. Are you modeling after Arkansas? And also, if there is a work requirement, is there other funding for like childcare assistance and other things like that so people can work? Well, that's, that second part of the question is very interesting because 
I think that one of the issues that the legislature really didn't address was the cost of administering this policy. And the thinking is, there's some thinking that it costs more to administer a policy that requires work and requires people to certify they're looking for work or trying to, or providing some assistance of community, uh, some community assistance than there is in just letting people enroll. So that's the one question. We think, I can't remember what's in our budget to do that, but a lot of people are worried that it's not enough. Then you got the issue about what does it look like and how is it administered. We've, we've got the waiver request out for commentary. I haven't actually looked at the waiver request, so I'm not sure exactly what it says. But in the legislation, it exempts, you know, postpartum uh, uh, women, it, it, uh, it exempts people who are disabled, it exempts uh, pregnant women. And there are all these exemptions in there. And there's, I mean, at one point, I thought there were so many, uh, there's so many exemptions you could drive a Mack truck through the whole process and it really didn't mean very much other than an aspirational goal that you would try to help people not have to qualify. So. Until that waiver is approved, we don't know exactly what the program's gonna look like. And then, how is it administered in terms of the cost? That'll be the second issue. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty right now with this, and then there'll be the legal challenges, because ours tends to look more like Kentucky. In Kentucky, we already have a court decision right now that says it's, it's, it's not legal, or whether it'll stand or not, I don't know, but there is a decision right now. Now, the, uh, the work requirement was the result of, of a compromise in, in the legislature, um, and you were a key player in, in that process. Um, I wondered if you might talk a little about um, the drama that some of us followed last spring um, in the legislature as, as you achieved that compromise with, with, the, um, with the Republicans and, right. and with the Senate. Uh, there, there was a lot of drama, and I think, you know, you, I, I handed it to my Republican colleagues. It wasn't easy for them to take a vote like this because they, so many of them had voted against expansion for years. And so for them to reverse themselves, put themselves at some ri at, uh, uh, risk of being primary. And I think that what, what happened over the course of the session is people began to say, whoa, we need some cover here. We need to be able to tell our constituents that is, this isn't a, quote, giveaway program. This is a program that requires people who, don't, who shouldn't be on it to not be on it. And that's why this work requirement came up. So Demo the Democrats generally don't like these work requirements. They think they're, they're, they don't really accomplish what they're supposed to be doing, and they cost a lot of money in the process, and they discourage people from getting benefits that they really need. But we were willing to swallow that pill on our side, at least most of us, for the sake of getting this 400,000 potentially on the rolls. And that's how it works sometimes in terms of compromise. Would we rather have straight Medicaid expansion? Yes. Were we willing to do this in order to get Medicaid expansion? Yes. And that's where the, that, that's where the compromise was struck. Do you see that compromise as, um sort of going forward as, as helping to broker more bipartisan work in the legislature? Well, I, I, you know, I'm an optimistic guy. I always loved the idea of having more bi bipartisan work uh, happening in the legislature. You know, we're a fair, we, we do pass a lot of bipartisan bills, but uh, the Washington uh, disease sometimes percolates across the Potomac, and we have to guard against that because Washington really isn't very bipartisan at all. So I'm hopeful we'll be able to do some more things. I think we need to, you know, this is a medical center on Medicaid, but there are things we can do on criminal justice. There are things we can do on education. There are things that we can do on energy where I think you could get a broad bipartisan consensus on things. Uh, you, put, you take tax policy, that's very difficult. But all the, some of these other things, I think they're, they're opportunities to work together. Good, thanks. Um, just to wrap up, do we have any other closing comments or questions 
from anyone here, then I might. Oh, yes. Okay. No, 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 you go on the recording. <laughs> you, need to, you need to be on YouTube. Oh, there you go. Tell um, us who oh, you are. Oh, a related topic, I'm Danny Becker. I'm a general internist, recently retired, and then more recently rehired. Um, <laughs> Part-time work. I'm an hourly employee. Um, <laughs> the Related to Medicaid reform, what about prison reform in the Commonwealth? Now that's for me, right? That's for all of you. Well, well I think yeah, it's for I, Carolyn and, and David. Yeah. But I, I, I think you will get some reforms coming out in the next few years. I think uh, from a conservative point of view, I think people are beginning to realize that it is just so expensive to incarcerate people for longer and longer periods of time. Most people, and without any kind of rehabilitation, most people get out after they've served time, and they get out often without the ability to work, and then you got a problem either they, you know, they have to go on Medicaid if they can't work, or they have some other assistance that they get. Uh, and I think people begin to realize the cost of prisons are high and the cost, social costs are high too. But particularly in the juvenile section, that's where I think you're gonna see more reform. People now do not like the idea of warehousing kids because it trains them for criminal activity later on. And so now you're gonna see a scaling down of the size of these facilities and different kinds of programming in these facilities that will speak to the conservatives' desire to cut funding and the liberals' desire to be more uh, rehabilitative, at least I hope. At least when they come out of prison, now they'll have health coverage with Medicaid expansion and the uh, if for those of you who are interested in the work requirement issue, um, you may want to look at Montana's uh, Medicaid expansion. It's actually sunsetting. They're, it's, they're going to go back and, and see if they, it was like a pilot and they're going to go back. But one of the things Montana did that the Commonwealth of Virginia may think about is uh, uh, connecting Medicaid expansion work requirements with funding for job training programs because uh, they often work hand in hand. And if the goal is to help people get out of poverty or low income so they can enter the workforce, then it might be helpful to have both health coverage to keep you healthy, to attend job training programs, and then hopefully move off of Medicaid. And I think, Carol, Glenn, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the Medicaid expansion here in Virginia now now is going to cover all of the prison population, when in, before, a lot of the costs were borne by the state directly. So that's a, a place where the federal dollars are replacing the state, some of the state dollars and saving us some money. So it sounds like there's lots of change afoot. We'll all stay tuned for January 1, when some of this starts to roll out. Please join us next week, um, October 3rd. We're going to have a Reader's Theater here, starring four of the UVA medical students, and also you as the audience discussing the play that they perform. Um, so please join us for William Carlos Williams' A Face of Stone in Reader's Theater. Uh, thanks, please, to uh, Carolyn Engelhard, David Toscano, and Chris Guyamagami, and thanks to all of you for being here. <laughs>